So uh, I also am a, a strawberry breeder, and I uh, inherited responsibility for a very old breeding program that has produced many cultivars over the years, some of which you may be familiar with. The, the breeding program actually predates traffic lights, so it's been around a long, long time. <laughs> And, and it's a wonderful po breeding population that I get to work with, uh, famous around the world for natural disease resistance and excellent flavor. Now, all of you are food producers, expert food producers, but because of the way your businesses are set up, you're also in marketing and advertising, aren't you, in sales. You're experts in all these things too, right? So, so I'm sorry. Wannabe. Wannabe, <laughs> Wannabe. yeah. So, so one of the things that makes it easy to sell a fruit is the way it tastes, right? Okay, so, so today we're going to focus on how we're helping with that process for you. And as Mike said, we got a, a fun chance to collaborate. We had a third party involved, another scientist at the USDA. This was a, a map that provided the names of everybody involved, and the strawberries indicated the research sites. but. Our research site is just north of the DC Beltway, and of course, Mike's research site is here. And also involved is um, Sunny Luo from, from the Beltsville lab. She's in the uh, food quality lab, which is very close to us. So here at the Y Research Center, uh, Mike produced fruit from uh, five different once fruiting cultivars listed here. All Star, Chandler, Early Glow, Flavor Fest, and the new one from Rut, uh, Rutgers, Rutgers Scarlet. You forgot you had that one? Okay, so, and, and he produced in these black plastic beds and uh, sent the fruit to Beltsville, either through me or brought it over himself. And it, this all happened in the middle of May, which was a little too early this was last year, a little too early for our once fruiting types. So this was a great opportunity for us to collaborate. In Beltsville, I produced repeat fruiting, well, fruit from repeat fruiting cultivars listed here, Albion, Monterey, Portola, San Andreas, and, and Seascape. And to do that, I had to produce the fruit in these low tunnels uh, that, that we started working with in 2011 and have really shown a lot of promise, and you'll be hearing about a, another talk about this uh, after the break. So uh, then Sunny, uh, at, also at Beltsville in the fruit quali food quality lab, uh, they sorted the fruit. She and, and her uh, support scientist, Yunhi Park, um, who I couldn't get a picture of. <laughs> anyway, they sorted the fruit, they prepared it, they trained a taste panel, a couple of panels in fact, and, and I, had, I sat in on some of the training, and it was very enlightening. All the, all the data that they produced from the taste testing, can you see okay, uh, was on a, a scale of 0 to 100. And they, they trained the panel. They said, okay, now, let's, as an example, let's look at juiciness. Uh, is it juicy like an apple peel, which is a 0, or is it juicy like a cucumber slice, you know, the inside, the fleshy part? And so then when they tasted the strawberry, they said, and it was cut open, is it juicy like the apple or is it juicy like the cucumber peel? And, and so they had this line from 0 to 100, and the participants just marked on the line where they thought it ranked between the two extremes. I just thought that was interesting because there's lots of ways you can, can, can uh, perform a, a taste panel. So that's the way this one was done. So all of the things that they tested for were from 0 to 100 in this taste panel, which made correlation studies really easy. So one of the first things you ask is, well, what are your, what are people, what are customers, what are people who eat strawberries, what do they think is the overall, what does quality mean to them? What is a good fruit? And it turns out that, and other studies have found this, Sweetness is really important. How sweet is that strawberry? And then the strawberry flavor. Does it taste like a strawberry or does it taste like a peach? No, they want it to taste like a strawberry. 
does, uh, what's the overall flavor like? And who knows what components that includes with a very complex flavor of a strawberry. But this is from a taste panel. So you were able to measure, well, what's the overall flavor? What's the fruity flavor level? How extreme is the strawberry aroma? What do you think about the overall texture, uh, the overall aroma, and the juiciness? These traits were all highly correlated with what they thought was a good quality strawberry. So that's interesting. And then I like to go back time after time after time. Sweetness comes out as being number one with consumers from all over, all walks of life, ages, and genders. So that's, that's pretty interesting, not just our program, but lots of studies have found this. So it makes it worthwhile to look at. Uh, as far as how do they rank the, the different cultivars, the, the uh, once fruiting cultivars are represented in black and the repeat fruiting cultivars are represented in gray. I'm just going to switch over here a little bit so you can see too, Mike. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's good to be short sometimes. Anyway, um, you can see that there's a mix, that it wasn't all one or the other. Um, these are, we were able to statistically separate the means for each of the different um, cultivars. So you can see Flavor Fest on the far left as being in the really top overall quality. All Star, Albion, Early Glow. The box indicating that there's no statistical difference between the very best and the others inside the box. And how many here are familiar with the flavor of Early Glow? Okay, pretty good, right? Outstanding. Great. Have you tried Flavor Fest? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Well, I will encourage you to try it. So. Um, Albion uh, ranked in this group too. Now that's a repeat fruiting cultivar. If you're interested in growing repeat fruiting strawberries under low tunnels, you can get really good quality from Albion there. As far as sweet and sour, those are really important components of flavor, right? And um, I've separated them out a little bit. It's a little hard to see the solid blocks refer to how sweet it is. And you remember how important that is. And again, Flavor Fest ranked in the top. And these are subjective ratings, but they were upheld when, when we also measured these chemically for percent soluble solids. Um, Flavor Fest and All Star ranked in the same group as far as sweetness. And then sourness, uh, we had Early Glow and Chandler and Rutgers Scarlet and Seascape. So Early Glow has a good flavor, but it's a tart flavor, right? But it's, a, it's also got that sugariness to balance it out. It's just a good, strong tasting. Well, okay, so Flavor Fest here also has a decent sourness, but it's not quite as tart as Early Glow. So I kind of like that, because then on a rainy day when you don't get much sugar, you can still count on a nice flavored berry. And some of them. What's wrong with early glow? It's a little bit smaller. Well, and Flavor Fest is big, so that's good. Yeah. So okay, and then there were two that were more tart than they were sweet, which is kind of interesting because these are cultivars, so they're acceptable flavor, right? So it's interesting that uh, you can have that juxtaposition. Seascape and uh, Rutgers Scarlet were in those classes. So overall flavor intensity, this is how strongly flavored these different fruits are. Again, Flavor Fest and Albion were on, well, Flavor Fest again is on the, the top level. And Portola, if any of you have ever tried Portola, and I know the people who work for me are in the back, um, John Enns and Phil Edmonds, I know they've had Portola, and it's practically flavorless. It's just almost nothing, at least in our location. I have had it in Canada and it's not that bad, but here it's practically flavorless. As far as strawberry flavor intensity, once again you have Flavor Fest over on the far left and it's in a class above everything else. The, the mean separations here, there's only Flavor Fest with an A and then there's All Star, 
all the way down through San Andreas have a B. That's how you tell the difference statistically between two different groups is with these little letters. At least that's, that, that's not how you tell the difference. That's just a good way to, to see what's different from what. <coughs> so Flavor Fest is doing pretty good here. Uh, juiciness and firmness. Firmness, there actually wasn't any significant difference that the taste panel detected between these cultivars. So they're all fairly successful cultivars, though some of them are too new to really judge how successful. So, but they're all pretty decent. You'd expect that in cultivars, that they should be fairly decent, right? So uh, as far as juiciness, there also isn't a whole lot of difference. Everything from Flavor Fest clear down to Seascape are statistically not different. It's just Flavor Fest is different from San Andreas. So pretty much the same juiciness, same firmness in these. So as I keep saying, Flavor Fest is doing pretty well on these taste panels, and of course that made us really happy. This was all blind, by the way. These, these panelists didn't know what they were tasting. Um, you were suggesting maybe, you know, early glow's too small, the fruit is, if you want to try a little bit. Early glow's an early season. Flavor Fest is a mid-season, so you could extend your season a little bit there. And then Flavor Fest has, has really large fruit and extremely high yield. These were grown in plastic culture, you know, Mike produced these. Uh, as I just pointed out, they've got excellent flavor, and they're resistant to the, um, the disease that we didn't hear about in the last talk, is Colatoptricum. I don't think the bugs were carrying any of the Colatoptricum around in them. So I guess that's good, right? Because <laughs> it's pretty bad disease. So, so early glow, Flavor Fest, All Star, they're all resistant to this anthracnose fruit rot. They are not resistant to, is Dr. Hugh speaking today? Okay. They're not resistant to the, the type of anthracnose that we don't typically have in this state, and Dr. Hugh is thankfully monitoring its progression or lack of progression from southern states up north. Uh, but they, they are resistant to the type of anthracnose we get here. We were pleased to find in the last three years, which had a lot of rain, that Flavor Fest is more rain tolerant than some of the others, which was nice. It does not require a lot of nitrogen, like uh, if you're used to growing Chandler, doesn't require as much nitrogen fertilizer as Chandler. It's more, it's more what we would call normal in its nitrogen requirements. It does have a shorter shelf life than I would like. Uh, it's not less, it's, it's still greater than Chandler, greater than Camarosa, which almost turn bad instantly as soon as you put them in the cooler. As soon as your customers take them home, if they don't eat them, they're gonna be complaining. But um, they're not gonna do that with Flavor Fest if they consume the fruit in about a week's time, which is about what you want. Uh, of course, I wanted more, and so we started selecting for longer shelf life. This was real important, and I, I won't go into detail but, uh, about how we did that unless later we ask. But um, we produced uh, a new cultivar that is just now moving from a production nursery out to other nurseries to propagate them for sales I guess the earliest might be, for most of you, <laughs> the earliest might be uh, fall of this year as plug plants and spring next year, they'll be broadly available from the nurseries that you might buy your plants from. And this new one is called Keepsake. And it has a, the best shelf life of any of the cultivars or breeding selections that we've been evaluating at Beltsville at our breeding program. It's also extremely sweet, very sweet, higher bricks level than uh, any of the cultivars that, that we've looked at. It has outstanding quality. It's big, it's beautiful, um, glossy, beautiful color, uh, attractive calyx. It's also rain tolerant, which is nice. It has a very nice yield mid-season. Uh, also, it doesn't require the same level of fertilizer that Chandler does, 
and it too is resistant to Colatotricum acutatum, which is the anthracnose fruit rot, like all our cultivars are. From the, the USDA breeding program at Beltsville, they're all resistant to the anthracnose fruit rot. So as an example, this gr uh, bar chart in black shows the portion of degraded fruit after a week in storage, and uh, the gray shows the portion of decayed fruit at two weeks. This is an averages across three years, and they're very rainy years, by the way. The reason that I, I actually evaluate all the fruit for both these traits for, for two weeks, but remember how I was talking about the separation of means statistically, which allows you to see differences between cultivars and breeding selections? Well, the best separation for de degradation of the fruit occurred at one week, and the best separation for decay of occurred at two weeks. So that's why I used the two different time periods to show how these, the fruit from these different cultivars go through storage. So the keepsake is um, the lowest rot of all. Chandler and Camarosa are the highest. They, they de I'm sorry, this is degradation. They degrade in different ways. Chandler and Camarosa turn color and get mushy and lose their gloss almost immediately. Um, Flavor Fest and, and, uh, just tends to kind of dehydrate. It just kind of shrinks a little. So it's, it's not really bad to look at, not like it was rotten or anything. You'd still eat it. Uh, but it does have a fairly good incidence of that. Um, early glow tends to get soft spots on the shoulders around the neck of the, the berry. Um, well, keepsake doesn't do a whole lot of anything. It just, it just stays nice and pretty. <laughs> yeah, it, it just stays nice through storage. And then if you look at the gray bars in, in the amount of decay, primarily this is um, botrytis because we've got mostly anthracnose resistance there. Occasionally we'll see a berry. It's very rare. Maybe in an entire harvest there'll be one berry that has anthracnose in it. That's how rare it is. So this is primarily botrytis you're looking at. And since the fruit were put in storage, were perfect when they were put in storage. They looked perfect. There's no rot when we first packaged them in the field. This is what um, our previous speaker referred to. Where'd she go? Maggie. Anyway, um, this is what's referred to as latent decay. So this is, it infected the flower, and it's just showing up in storage. And, and keepsake also had really low um, storage rot. Now we also evaluate the fruit, I wonder if you can see that. We also evaluate the fruit subjectively uh, in the, each spring. And um, I've, I've not really, um, this is a different sort of statistics. This is just an average and then the total range of what I saw over 10 years of collecting data. Um, in I've, I've listed the cultivars on the left just alphabetically. Um, keepsake is towards the bottom here, Flavor Fest, Early Glow, sort of in the middle. I'm trying to, there we go, Keepsake, Flavor Fest, Early Glow. Soluble solids is, is this actual measurement of sweetness as opposed to what we were talking about earlier where people, how they perceive sweetness. Then there's acidity that we're measuring as a pH and our strawberries have a fairly narrow range from, oh, sometimes we'll see one at about 3.1 after a rainy day, for instance, and then um, other times they'll be quite high, uh, four or above. Flavor is a subjective evaluation that, that uh, John Enns and I do together in the field. Firmness, likewise, is we just have, a f have fruit and we feel it, and after, you know, thousands and thousands of them, you just get a feel for a num numeric range that we have that, that goes from zero to nine. And skin, t skin toughness, we just rub the fruit a little bit. You don't want it coming off. You don't want that skin coming off. You want that berry to remain intact. So a certain amount of fruit firmness, a certain amount of toughness helps that berry get from your field to your customer's refrigerator intact. That's good. So. Um, Anywhere where the, the, the highest for any particular trait 
I've put in bold and in red, and I'm not sure you can see it, but I'll just highlight Keepsake had the highest soluble solids. You're used to early glow at 8.2% soluble solids. Keepsake is at, at 8.7. Um, with acidity, 3.6 for Flavorfest and, and Keepsake. Your early glow is a little bit more tart, 3.5. So this kind of reflects fairly well what people experience when they taste the fruit. Um, flavor ratings, Keepsake was highest. Flavor Fest and Early Glow are about the same. Firmness, again, Keepsake is highest. The only one that's as high is Camarosa, which is so, sort of notorious for being firm. But a lot of people pick Camarosa too uh, unripe because Camarosa will turn kind of dark purple when it's, well, not kind of dark purple. It just has a purplish cast to it when it's really ripe for us. And so people tend to think, oh, that's too ripe. I won't pick that. And they tend to pick Camarosa early, so it's really hard. So I don't want you to think that just because Keepsake and Camarosa have the same firmness rating that Keepsake is hard, unpleasantly hard, because it's not. Camarosa is partly have, has this, this um, reputation for being hard because people tend to pick it too early. So it's, it's, Keepsake has a good firmness that you'll like. And as far as skin toughness, it also rated quite high. So it's, a, it's a good one to try when it becomes available. Please do ask your, your um, favorite nursery uh, when they'll be getting it in. Yeah, I think uh, it's going to get pulled through by the flavor. I think one, one thing I've learned in my few years as a strawberry breeder is that flavor is really more important than any of us will give credit to because consumers will f forgive a lot for flavor. And with Keepsake and Flavor Fist, there's really nothing to forgive. They're both very good. As far as yield goes, um, Flavor Fest is, is really one of our top yielders. And Keepsake, if you look up here, see the A's and the B's? Flavor Fest and All Star are, are consistently our top yielders. Keepsake, Ovation is a, a very late cultivar that's very hard, if impossible, to get a hold of anymore, but it's a very nice quality berry. Um, they're not, they have nothing to be ashamed of. Camarosa has a pretty good yield in our studies. Early Glow and Chandler have, have slightly lower yields. Mike, you've found this as well with Chandler that it doesn't yield as well as we, we deserve here. So um, the, the cultivars that are boxed in red are cultivars from our program. And the <coughs> numbers behind them are the number of years of data that went into this, this slide. Nine years. Camarosa we've only evaluated for two years for yield. On the bottom here is the percent of rot that occurs in the field. You see with each cultivar there's two bars. There's the bar on the left has to do with total yield, and the bar on the right for that cultivar has to do with the amount of yield that's not rotted. So down on the bottom, 14 and a half, 15, 14, 7, 12, 11, 16 percent rot in, rot in the field. And then before you saw the slide about in storage. And the conversion, I've got these all in grams, so it's hard to tell, but the conversion for uh, grams to pounds is 453 grams per pound, if you want to take that over. The highest yield that we've gotten for Flavor Fest, which is the highest yielding here, is around, uh, I think it was 40, I'm having trouble remembering, it's either 45 or 47,000 pounds per acre. So it was a, that was a great year. <laughs> Not one of these rainy years. <laughs> and that's at a population rate of about 17,000 plants per acre. And uh, hmm, I guess that was the last one. Sorry. I, I was expecting more. I apologize. So if um, there's any questions? Jim, the one thing you may point out, those were your yields. You don't put any fungicides on them. Thank you for reminding. Thank you very much, Bob. Since we breed for 
for cultivars that are resistant to disease naturally, the best way to do that is to not use any fungicides in the field, any fumigants in the field. And, and when you look at these <coughs> levels of, of rot here, this is really critical, Bob. I don't know why I didn't mention that. That's, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, these are without any fungicides at all. And when you go back to the, the amount of rot that occurs in storage, remember this is without any fungicides at all. So if you choose to add fungicides, then these numbers drop down considerably too. But in those years that are too wet to add fungicides, it's kind of nice to know you've got a cultivar with you that, that keeps those, that level of rot down if you can just get the customers to come out and pick the fruit, right? <laughs> Any more questions for Kim? Yes, hey, Guy. Kim, you have a, a, a rind to replace a uh, ovation, a late variety? I have one coming soon. I'm pretty sure that it's going to become a cultivar. It's uh, another one of these that does well in the rain. It's, it's it's not as late as ovation, but um, it's, it is somewhat late. The number is uh, 2360, B2360, and um, it's, it's possible I'll push that through this year, if not this year, next year. But one of the, you know, you can do all the research and the, and the, the development and the testing, but the next step where you get it out into the nurseries is actually quite a challenge. Something that they never train us to do at all. But um, it, it, it'll be, I'll be talking about it probably next year, if, if not then, the year after. But it's, it's got, again, sweet, very good shelf life, um, pushing shelf life very hard because, I don't know, if. if it goes through a lot of testing before you go to shelf life. And if you, if you find out it's great as a seedling, great in the observation plots, great in the yield trials, and then you find out that it's got lousy shelf life, that's a lot of work that went into that process that suddenly is wasted. So I'm pushing that really hard right now in choosing my parents. Where they've got this wonderful variety, whether it's strawberries, fruits, or whatever fruit it is. You make that jump from from the lab to the nursery to the field is 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 huge, and it, it's it's almost like a brick wall there. You say, I got this wonderful variety. Why in the world won't you won't you just take it and run with it? So it's, that would be a good talk. To try I to educate the, the end users, us growers, yeah. the difficulties uh, you all have trying to get this thing to us. I think that there is, there is help in that area. Um, there's, have you heard of the National Clean Plant Network? Okay, well the National Clean Plant w Network is a, is a USDA funded, literally, network of labs. Some worked by universities, am I going over too much time here? You just okay, push me out. Okay, and, and what they do is they uh, it's kind of like our germplasm rep repositories, they, they maintain these <coughs> cultivars, but unlike the germplasm repositories, they only maintain cultivars. And they propagate the cultivars just to get them to the nurseries. And then it's the nursery's job to propagate them and get them to growers. But um, the Clean Plant Network tests for all the viruses that are in the United States maybe even some outside the United States, and they, um, they only send clean plant material to the nurseries. That helps the nurseries get virus-free material to you. And I know that we had a virus problem a couple years ago. The Clean Plant Network got a huge boost in funding to counteract that, that uh, threat to us and in the agriculture industry. So we do have some help there. Okay? Thank you.